Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring us a retrospective and fight picks for our fight night taking place on Saturday. So that's going to be Walt Harris taking on Alistair Overeem. We're also going to be going over the picks for our fight night where Glover Teixeira manhandled, destroyed, we'll talk about it, uh, but utterly dismantled Anthony Smith. Let's get into it. Here's the show. All right, before we get into the fight picks for that Walt Harris, Alistair Overeem card, let's talk about Smith versus Teixeira. So overall on that card, we came in at just 50% accuracy. Not my finest work, but hey, I'll take it. That is as good as you can do if you're flipping a coin, so we didn't come in underneath that. And there were some close calls. Realistically, I think we probably should have came in a little bit higher, but hey, you know, split decision here. Um, Hunter Azure catching, you know, that great knockout shot by Brian Kelleher. And hey, you know, we're down to 50%. It is what it is. Uh, but we did actually nail the Patreon pick. So our three picks on Patreon were the Vittori fight. That was canceled. Uh, Robertson, Robertson was not able to uh, make the fight. He had some medical issues after making weight. So that fight did not take place. But the two we had that were on Patreon was the Hunter Azure fight. And we also had the Glover Teixeira fight, one of which was an underdog and a payout. So if you you took the picks, the two of them, you definitely came out on top with that Glover call. And let's talk about the main event because there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, first off, I, I said it on Twitter, but it's like, fool me four times, shame on me. I could not pick against Glover Teixeira again. And the numbers shook out that way. I got to be honest, I would have been coming at you with a heavy grain of salt if the numbers had picked Smith. But they picked Teixeira and we came out well in that one. But holy hell, uh, Smith was given a barrage of information by his corner. He was overwhelmed and he threw basically everything he had in his gas tank at Teixeira through the first round and and maybe like a minute or two into round two. And then after that, it was really all Teixeira. Teixeira was stalking, hunting, uh, and he was so patient. Uh, You know, when you have as much experience as Glover Teixeira does, it really showed in that contest. The younger, more explosive Smith looked good early on, and then it was really bad uh, to the point where I think his corner, Anthony Smith's corner, totally let him down by allowing him to go back into the fight. Uh, Smith had had his teeth knocked out. Uh, I'm pretty sure he had maybe a broken orbital. He was probably concussed. He had a lot of issues, and he really wasn't defending himself uh, after the second or third knockdown. He he should have had the towel thrown in for him, and Jason Herzog, who I'm sure Dominic Cruz would have loved to have had a ref- as a referee in retrospect, but Jason Herzog, you know, really let Smith go out on his shield, and I really don't blame Herzog here. The corner is just as responsible. You know, uh, the corner should recognize that their fighter has more fights left in them in their career as a whole and not take a short-sighted look at things, especially when your fighter has his teeth knocked out, when you can see that he's not throwing any kind of adequate strikes uh, when he's just dead in there. And so his corner totally let him down. I think everybody at the commentary table, DC included, uh, definitely thought this exact same thing. So sad to see to uh, Smith go out, um, but I I said it earlier, you know, I think Teixeira is on a crash course to potentially fight John Jones again. I don't know if that fight interests Jones, but it's certainly something that could happen, and I'm sure Teixeira would love to try to avenge that loss. I don't know if Teixeira could beat Jones, but he just went out and beat the crap out of Anthony Smith, so anything can happen. We'll see how things go at light heavyweight. There's a lot of contenders up there. There's that Reyes rematch. There's there. Blakovich or Blaskovitz fight out there as well. I call him Blaskovitz, but <laughs> Blakovich. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens at the light heavyweight 205 pound division. Then the rest of the way, um, yeah, we had kind of a you know off and on. Like I said, we went uh, five for five. Or sorry, five over five for ten, or five and five. Five wins, five losses on the night. Uh, the Rothwell fight, we missed that one. I think it was a tight call, though. I, I think Ovens might have probably should have won the fight. To be honest, he was outstruck, but it seemed like he did better damage to Rothwell. Hard to say. I, I can't argue with the ultimate numbers. You know, greater strikes, scoring that takedown. So 
Um, you know, tough call, tough loss, but we took that one. Uh, the Drew Dober fight, Alex Hernandez, another loss for us. This one, um, you know, Dober did not steal it away. He was much better than Hernandez, and he definitely deserved that victory. I'm looking to see good things out of Dober now that he's in the top 15 at 155 pounds. Now we got to look down. Ricky Simone, Ray Borg. We picked Simone on this one, but it was a split decision, and it was a tough one to watch. Borg's boxing was incredible. Simone's boxing was okay, but really the story here are the takedowns. Seven takedowns for Simone. Uh, he definitely was a lot, po- a lot more powerful than the smaller fighter in Borg, who naturally used to fight at 125 pounds. So it's interesting to see what will happen with Borg, uh, especially since Simone is not the biggest bantamweight out there. Uh, Borg does not, I think, have a future at bantamweight um, after the way he looked against Simone. Uh, he will, he will definitely have bigger problems, especially with such crisp boxing and not being able to put a guy down. He realistically has to get his weight in check and go back to flyweight to be competitive. Uh, but we'll see how things play out for him. We did get that one correct as well. Arlovsky and Felipe Linz, uh, we got this one wrong. Arlovsky looked very good in there. Looked like a uh, vet for sure. And, uh, you know, we'll see Linz back again, I'm sure. But he did not get a W for us. Then another one I was surprised at, uh, Tiago Moises. Uh, he throws one strike and <laughs> goes for one submission and picks up the ankle lock. 25 seconds into round number two. This is one that, uh, you know, you just can't really predict. Uh, much like, you know, the Kelleher... Uh, Azure fight. I had gone out, picked Michael Johnson. He was beating the crap out of Moises on the feet. Uh, he was out striking him like mad, but you, you score a takedown, you get in a good an- uh, ankle lock position, and you know exploit a, a guy like Johnson who has struggled on the ground despite being you know a great sprawl and brawl style fighter. Uh, he was able to get a win. So hey, hats off to Tiago and you know and work on your striking though. I gotta say, as you you go up in the division, it is only gonna get harder from here if you can't strike. Then Sajar Eubank, Sarah Morris, easy fight to call. Um, you know, maybe not easy in retrospect, uh, but Sajar Eubank uh, outstruck her two to one, scored some great takedowns, uh, passed her on the ground. It was uh, so some really phenomenal stuff. Not the highest level of MMA, but phenomenal performance by Eubanks, and I thought she was an easy call despite uh, them both not having the best records. Then in a real barn burner of a contest, we had Omar Morales defeat Gabriel Benitez. And uh, this one we did get correct. Also, Omar Morales, excellent, phenomenal striker, as is Benitez. But I do question where he'll be in his kickboxing style MMA career uh, going forward. He had one of the worst cuts or gouges or I don't even know. It was like a wound. You can't even call it a cut. It was a wound on his shin and the bone was exposed. I've never seen a nastier cut from checking kicks and landing kicks than what Gabriel Benitez has. Uh, his turnaround time is going to be horrible. Uh, like Dana White said in the press conference, you start throwing that thing too early, it's just going to split open again. I do not know uh, where Benitez's career will take him from here. He is not a top flight guy like a Luke Rockhold with a lot of incentive to come back, uh, you know, getting big paydays. But we'll see what happens for him. Uh, he's truly a warrior, and if we don't see him again for a long time or ever again, I certainly understand why it's Kind of a sad way to go out for a guy that kicks as hard as he does. So, got that one correct. Hats off to Omar Morales. And then in the last two here, Brian Kelleher defeats Hunter Azure. Hunter Azure was out striking him 2-1. to one. He looked really good. Uh, he had the speed, good footwork, and Kelleher just catches him, you know. Kelleher's a tough guy, and he weathered the Azure storm. Azure was, was you know, winging a lot of shots, I think, and he just wasn't connecting really cleanly, even though he was connecting 2-1 to one on Kelleher. Kelleher just made it count and picked up a win in a fight that I do not think he would have gotten the decision on looking at the numbers here and what I recall. So, uh, like I said, a couple of fights just really didn't go our way. I, you know, we probably should have got Azure. We probably, sh- I mean, the Michael Johnson fight was really too early to say, but Johnson had just, you know, held off that takedown. I think it was him all day. And then the Oven same proof fight, you know, that we just as easily could have went eight and two as we ended up going five and five. It's just the way these MMA things play out. But at the end of the day, the Patreon was right. And Glover Teixeira, our one underdog pick, and, and hey, we picked it up. So, you know. You did well if you listen to me there. And then our last one, Chase Sherman, Ike Villanueva. We had picked Sherman in this one, but it was a um, it was a debut fight. So, you know, got to take some sort of grain of salt. Either way, we did get it correct. So, like I said, 5-5 five and five on the night. Uh, not my finest work, but there were some 
there were some, you know, just MMA gods, you know, not playing along with the picks, and I was happy with them. I think we could have went 80% accurate, but we ended up going 50%, and we still were in the money on the Patreon picks, which is where I really, you know, try to direct you guys towards if you want those, uh, and Teixeira was a solid dog for us in that outing. So, anyways, let's move on here to the fight picks for Saturday. All right, so in our main event, taking place again in Jacksonville, Florida, the last fight we're going to have in Jacksonville, Florida for a little while, we're going to have Alistair Overeem taking on Walt Harris. So this is a kind of a tough call to make for me because there is a huge mental factor here for one Walt Harris. His stepdaughter was murdered, sadly, and even though you know I can't account for that in any numbers, there's certainly an intangible to this contest that I cannot capture and I think needs to be said uh, for anybody out there listening that you know despite what I'm going to call, you got to take it with a grain of salt because we don't know what kind of mental state Harris is in. I think it could play to the positive form, give him kind of a, a will to fight. Could also be something that's hindered him in his training and leading up to the fight. We're not really sure. Could make him become less patient. Could make him do a lot of different things. We're just not aware. But I am ultimately picking over him in this one. Now, if we side on the fact that this tragedy to Harris is going to push him in the negative direction, I, again, think it's over him all day. But he could have some kind of drive that numbers do not speak to. But at the end of the day, Overeem is a hugely salty veteran, a guy with a lot of experience, a guy with technical striking, technical submissions, um, a crazy work ethic, uh, superior reach, uh, I think superior size in a lot of ways, although the Uberim days are a little bit behind us. He's a guy that can defeat anyone on, on his best day. You know, that Roizenstruck fight, he should be on a three-fight winning streak, but that Roizenstruck fight, you know, he was derailed at a few seconds left. I think as long as Uberim, Overeem's chin is still okay, which, I mean, hey, and his 45-18 uh, and 18 record, I'm pretty sure it's just fine. Um, I think it's going to be too much for Harris. Harris is 13-7. and seven. You know, he's put together some good wins, right? He's got three in a row, uh, uh, sorry, two, well, really three in a row. He had a no contest with Arlovsky, but uh, he beat Spitz, he beat Spivak, and he beat Olenek. Obviously, he had that no contest in between with Arlovsky, but I think that, I, I honestly think that Overeem is just going to be too much for him. I think that the striking is going to be too much. Um, it's just all that experience, and I don't believe that Walt Harris is going to be able to land that one big shot like Roizenstruck was able to. I think that it's going to be tough uh, for him. So I am picking Alistair Overeem in this contest. He's the pick in our heavyweight main event. All right. In our co-main, we have kind of a dark horse firefight. I think it actually is going to be a firefight because I expect it to be awesome. We have Claudia Gadelia taking on Angela over Kill Hill. And so... If you've listened to me for a while, you know that I really can't nail down Angela Hill no matter what I do. I'm terrible at picking for or against her. Take it with a grain of salt. This will definitely not be one of my locks of the evening, as we say. So Claudia Gadelia is projected by me to beat Angela Hill. Now, Angela Hill has looked phenomenal lately. Three wins in a row, Carnalosi, Seifers, and Lukabume really good wins for somebody who had struggled, right, you know, kind of earlier in her career. I think she's finally getting it together. But we've seen Gadelia at the top for a while, right? She lost to Nina, or beat Carla Esparza, uh, lost to Jessica Andrade, lost to Nina Ansaroff, back with a win against Ronda Marcos. I mean, she was off and on, but she's still a very competent fighter, and her takedown and submission game is there with her BJJ skills, and I think that's going to be the difference here. Although, the striking output and potential of Hill, I think, is also there, along with a, you know, small but possibly advantageous reach advantage for Hill. 
If this fight can stay standing, I think it's Hill all day, and I think Hill has the skills to do that, but we've seen Gedalia so aggressive with the takedowns, so forceful to get them, that we cannot overlook that, and that's where the numbers ultimately back up Gedalia, is with that takedown skill set. Her striking is totally fine. Uh, it's, it's totally adequate for this weight class. It's not superior. You know, it's not Nama Yunus level. It's not Jun Jacek level. It's not Zhang level. Uh, but her takedown skills are top tier for the 115-pound weight class. And I think, based on what I'm looking at here, that will be the way or her pathway to victory. She stays standing with Hill. She tries to challenge her there. I think that she will have a long night, and I do not think she'll be able to to pick up a win. Her bread and butter's on the ground. That's her best avenue to victory. And if she is going to win, it's probably going to be at the detriment to uh, having, you know, not thrown as many punches that have landed on Hill. I think it is going to be takedowns that make the day for Cadelia, and she's the pick. However, I have picked many a wrong for Angela Hill. So uh, I'll come back and eat my words, or who knows, maybe I'll be an Angela Hill picking machine going forward. <laughs> Let's see how it plays out on Saturday. All right, in our next contest, we are going to have the debut of Edson Barboza taking on Dan Ige, a vet at 145 pounds. So Barboza is making his first appearance at Featherweight, and so all of the numbers here have to be taken into question. These, this is not the kind of thing that you straight up agree to. We don't know what the weight cut is like for him. There's a lot of questions to be answered here for Barboza, but he is a good striker. However... <laughs> <laughs> All that being said for Barboza, I am picking Ige in this one. Ige has the superior numbers where it counts, and that's going to be takedowns. And we've seen Barboza struggle with guys that are great wrestlers and takedown artists. So assuming this weight cut you know, drains the gas tank, makes it tough for Barboza to stay competitive, I think Ige wrestles him, da wrestles him down and is able to hang with him long enough on the feet to set up those shots and keep it grinding on the cage and keep it a ground and pound affair for him. If, for whatever reason, he tries to stand with Barboza, though, I do not believe he has the skill set to hang with him. I think that it will be a short night for Ige, especially given his size disadvantage. But we don't know where Barboza's health is going to be. We don't know what his gas tank is going to be. We don't even know if this fight's honestly going to take place. He could end up like, you know, Roberson this past week and have to go to the hospital after making weight. We don't know. I'm not super confident he honestly is going to make weight despite being a pro. He's an older guy. Um, you know, it's, it's, to go down 10 pounds when he was already so cut and so ripped, you know, I'd have to assume that he had to deplete muscle mass to get there. And, you know, making these rapid changes to the body are usually not a good thing when it comes to, you know, high-level athletic performance. So we'll see how things play out. I am picking Ige here. I think that he is obviously the much better wrestler. I think he can get it done on the ground. I just hope that he does not stand with Barboza, who I think will exploit some weakness and, and you know, the size advantage that he has over Ige. So we'll see how it plays out, but we are picking Ige in this contest. All right, in our next contest at heavy, sorry, next contest at middleweight, <laughs> heavy middleweight, no. Uh, next contest at middleweight, we're going to have Eric Anders, your boy, taking on Christoph Jotko. And in this one, I really like Anders, honestly, as a fighter, but I got to go with Jotko here. The numbers just support it a little bit better. I think that he's looking really good, wins over Barrier and Amadovsky. Uh, however, you know, let's not sleep on... Um, on your boy. We got Mearshart and we have Maria in his last two outings too. So both these guys got two fight winning streets. Uh, they're coming in pretty hot. I just like the skill set a little bit better out of Jotko. I think he's a little more technical striker. Uh, however, I think the takedown game might be a little better on Anders' part. But I see this fight mostly standing, and I think that's where Jotko can take over. He has the fight experience advantage. I think he has the fight IQ advantage, and he should be able to use his you know, slightly larger frame. He's got a two-inch reach advantage, slightly larger frame to defeat Anders. Also, both guys are southpaws going in, so nobody's going to be able to exploit that. But I think, again, Jodko's experience will be better at exploiting, uh, you know, that southpaw versus southpaw uh, contest. And I am going with Jodko in this one. So we are picking up Christoph Jodko to win this metalweight bout.
in another amazing contest we're going to have at Featherweight. We have Song Yudong, the hot Chinese prospect coming out of Team Alpha Male, taking on Marlo Chito Vera. And I expect this fight to be phenomenal. Chito Vera usually brings the heat, and we've seen some great stuff out of Dong. However, he did have a draw with Cody Stamen in his last outing, which you know had has me calling into question really where he is. Uh, is he at the level to compete against a guy like Vera? And ultimately here, I'm going to say no. I do not think that after that performance he put in against Stamen, he's going to have what it takes to defeat Vera. Now, these are different fight styles, though. Vera, much more of a stand-up fighter. Uh, Stamen, much more of a wrestling heavy fighter, the Spartan. But I don't, I didn't like the striking or really anything that Yudong did in that last outing. And I think that the more aggressive fighter in Marlon Vera is going to be able to go out there and make an early statement, hurt Yudong, and make him question himself. And I think that he was questioning himself after the draw with Stamen, where he wasn't able to effectively strike and effectively control the fight. Whereas Vera, he's on a outstanding win streak right now. And I think that's going to carry forward that confidence, that ability to, you know, switch stances more effectively, that small three inch or decent sized three inch reach advantage. He's the better fighter here. He's got better accuracy. He's got a better submission game overall. If this thing does make it to the ground, I am going with Marlon Chito Vera to pick up a win in this fire featherweight contest. All right, so in this next one here, we got a legend in Matt, the Immortal Brown, taking on Miguel Baeza. Baeza, a young prospect, you know, coming in here. Uh, he's 8-0, and and he's taking on a guy 24-16. and So this is going to be an interesting fight for sure. And in this one, I really, I really want Matt Brown to win, uh, you know, because I really like the guy. He's, he's a legend of the sport, and I'd love to see him go out with a W, but I got to go with Baeza here. I think he's just a better fighter. You know, we've seen good stuff out of Matt Brown recently. Wins over Saunders and Sanchez, whereas we only have one win for Baeza. But I think Baeza is just going to have the explosiveness to derail a guy that has had a, you know, questionable chin for a while. I think that Baeza is going to be able to land a couple of good shots, hurt Brown, and ultimately put him away. But we'll see how things play out. He is the immortal Matt Brown for a reason. The guy can fight through adversity, but I think that potentially Baeza could throw too much adversity at him. All that being said, though, Baeza has to be the one to face adversity. We know that Matt Brown brings the heat, and we know Baeza hasn't quite been tested yet since he is 8-0. We'll see how things play out, though, on Saturday. We are picking Miguel Baeza in this welterweight matchup. In a rock-solid middleweight contest, we are going to have Anthony Hernandez take on Kevin Holland. And Kevin Holland here looks really, really good. He's got a great size advantage, and I do like him here, but ultimately I am going to go with Hernandez. Hernandez striking and takedowns have just looked so good recently that despite the fact that I really like Kevin Holland, I have to go with Hernandez here. It's tough to overlook his takedown rate. You know, he's also coming off a win. Holland's coming off a loss. And I think ultimately Hernandez is going to be able to close that gap, make the size, you know, disadvantage or reach disadvantage that he has. Not a, not a problem at all. Get in there, shoot power doubles, and take Holland down. Uh, we know that Holland does not have the greatest takedown defense in the world, coming in at less than 50%. I think that that's going to be the game plan for Hernandez, and as long as he can execute on it, I think it's an easy win for him all day. Well, also, uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, is we, uh, we know Hernandez is shutting guys down early with a pretty short average fight time. So I think it's going to be early and quick. We'll see how things play out, though, with Anthony Hernandez as my projected winner in this contest. In our next matchup, we're going to have Mike Davis take on Giga Chickadees. And this one is a pretty decent fight at featherweight. Both of our guys here are coming off of wins. But ultimately here, I am going to side with Mike Davis. I think that he is the slightly better fighter. Um, but we'll, we'll see how things play out. This one is really, honestly, a grain of salt situation. I'm looking here at my numbers, and one of the metrics is picking Davis. One of them is picking Chickadees. And I'm just ultimately going to pick Davis, but this one could really go either way. I'm not uh, super confident with either pick, 
And, uh, you know, both these guys have, you know, one of them is 8 2, one of them is 9 2. They're both pretty green, pretty young prospects, and it's just really hard, I think, to make a confident call. Uh, but I do want to note that I think Chickadees does have the better gym. So we'll see how things play out. And, uh, you know, I am going still with that Mike Davis call in this contest. All right, this next one might be tough. For, uh, for you to take, but I got Darren Elkins taking on Nate Landwehr, and Elkins is coming off a three-fight losing streak, uh, so take this all in a grain of salt, but I am picking Elkins here. I think that he is the better fighter. We know that he can take damage, and we know that Nate Landwehr, you know, he, he he's a good fighter, but I don't know how he's going to do against Elkins. I'm hesitant in this pick, to be perfectly honest. I ultimately think that Elkins, you know, is a good fighter, but we didn't see much out of Landwehr in his first outing. He was a pretty quick um, dispatch by Herbert Burns, and so I don't think we've seen enough of Landwehr to, you know, say that he can't defeat Darren Elkins, but I got to go off of what I have, and I am going to pick Elkins in this one, although tough call to make um, overall. So again, take that one a great assault. And then our last fight here that isn't a debuter, we have Courtney Casey taking on Mara Barella. And in this one, I'm going to go with Barella. I think she has the experience. I think she has the takedown advantage. And I think she'll be able to shut down the high output fighter in Courtney Casey. Uh, and then finally, we have a debut fight where we will have, let's see here, Rodrigo Nascimento taking on Dantel Myers Mays. And in this one, I'm going to go with Nascimento. I think that he's looking like a better prospect coming into the UFC, especially coming in undefeated. Uh, so let's go over these guys one more time. We are going to have Overeem, Gedalia, Ige, Jotko, Vera, Baeza, Hernandez, Davis, Elkins, Romero Barella and Nascimento to round things out. So we'll see how things go. We have another decent card. There's some very solid fights on there, especially as we get towards the top. The Songi Nog Marl and Vera fight. I love watching Mike Brown. Um, the Ige fight with Barboza, that one, we'll, we'll see if it even happens. I, I'll be interested to see if Barboza can make weight. There's just a lot of really good fights on this card, and I am looking forward to Saturday because we are going to have a week off after that. Dana White is talking about moving the event uh, that was supposed to take place on the 23rd, 3rd to the 30th, and I think that's going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada. We'll see how things play out with that one, though. Uh, but if you want to get in touch with me in the meantime, please head over to your email and write fightingspurtpodcast at gmail.com to send me your questions, comments, thoughts, and ideas. You can also go on Facebook and like the page, ask me some questions, send me messages, whatever you want. And there's also the YouTube and everything else. So Please get out there, get in touch, let me know what you're thinking. Any questions you have for me, I'm more than happy to answer them on the show. Uh, so there's also going to be a Patreon pick out uh, today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow at this point. I'll kind of see how some of these uh, you know things go. Could even be Friday to watch the weigh-in, especially for that Barboza fight. I, I might be interested. I think Ige right now might be an underdog. Let's go ahead and check that one out. Before we get off here, I am like an Ige. I just want to know if the fight's going to take place before I make that kind of call here. Let's see. Uh, Ige right now, just plus 105, but that's still good money, I think, when we don't really know what kind of Barboza is going to show up. So we'll take that one a grain of salt. And there's another one here that I'm looking at that I like as well. We'll talk about it more over on Patreon. So if you want some of those fight picks, like I said, we nailed it with Teixeira this past week. Head on over there, support the Fighting Spirit Podcast at a financial amount that makes the most sense to you and uh, help support the show. It really does mean a lot to me for anybody that does go over there and gives me their hard-earned money. I'll always try to give you the best picks that I can for your hard-earned dollar. So, I'll be back with, well, I, you know, I'm probably going to have to do a retrospective alone because... We're not going to have a fight, and even that fight on the 30th, I think, is up in the air. So even though we're on the new format, I hope you're liking it, we are going to do an old format of a quick retrospective, or maybe a little longer retrospective, like the old style. We'll do that after this fight on the 23rd, and then hopefully we'll get back in a little more regularly scheduled uh, content, and we'll go from there. I'm thinking about doing a beer review, too, again soon with my wife. We'll see how all that goes until I speak with you again next time, though. Happy fight picking.